And now, I'd like to, this is exciting. We're, we're so exciting about this. This is a book launch for the book, How K-Dramas Can Transform Your Life, Powerful Lessons on Belongings, Healings, and Mental Health. Our speaker today, Jeannie Chang, explores how the wildly popular K-Drama global phenomenon can not just entertain us, but also can help us grieve from losses, heal trauma, improve our overall mental health, and navigate the complicated roadmap of life no matter what challenges we may face. I'm intrigued, and I'm not into K-Drama yet, so I expect today, today, I... I'm honest. I'm tra today. This is going to transform my. And I know I'm going to go home tonight and start binging. I I never knew where to start. I didn't have. So now I'm going to know where to start. So um, page 45 of my book. No, I'm <laughs> See, that's good. You're so Jeannie, who is right here, is a licensed marriage and family therapist and certified clinical trauma professional. She is, she is an accomplished international speaker, providing keynotes and offers workshops for corporations, community organizations, and colleges addressing the intersectionality of mental health and identity, diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging, and psychological safety, as well as education about topics such as burnout, resilience, mindfulness, stress, and mental health conditions, including anxiety, depression, and suicidal, suicidality. She serves as a subject matter expert on mental health for media outlets around the world, and she's the founder and CEO of Nunas Nunchi, is that right? LLC, a global wellness company. And accompanying her in conversation today is Susan Kim, Kim, who's a startup advisor and angel investor, as well as former CEO of Edmodo. And she will moderate. And Susan calls herself an avid K-drama fan. So you can cheer her while you boo me. <laughs> so well, welcome to both of you. And I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much. We'll win her over. <laughs> First of all, hitting the here. Whenever I hear the bio, I'm like, okay, they're reading the whole thing. I'm just, I'm just gonna uh, smile. No, I'm just gonna, but that's just like just the tip of the iceberg about Jeannie. So before we started the conversation, I actually just wanted to like talk about her a little bit more. Not only is she like a multi hyphenate, like you're like the J Lo of like mental health professionals. Um, but on top of that, like. Uh, a couple things. Fun fact, she started out her career as a broadcast journalist, um, but then followed her authentic self, I think, into this area of mental health. And I, you know, and then beyond that, I think Nunez Nunchi, which actually will be my first question, kind of grew out of your work mm -hmm. and now is this global social media wellness tourism company where you've got like sold out tours to Korea. Um, and I just, I just wanted to just kind of get into, oh, sorry, and before we go, um, she's also been married for 26 years and has four children, ages 17 to 23. So the fact that, you know, like busy is like an- more screens for that. They're like- Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like that is just, she is like a superwoman. So just, and then she wrote a book. So amazing. So I just wanted to talk and start with like Nunez Nunchi. Like how did yeah. that come about? First, I gotta admit, I'm super nervous. Um, yes, she feels me. Um, I'm usually not nervous because you guys know I talk all the time, you know? But this is the first time, this is technically my first book event. So when it's about you and your book, I was like, okay, let me practice mindfulness all day and breathe. So I'm just admitting to you that I'm hopefully, uh, as I'm talking, I'm getting less nervous because that's usually what happens. But when all this attention's on you, even though I like attention, I'll admit, um, this is a lot. So thank you for being here. It means a lot that, um, that you guys are here for me and the book. So we'll talk a little bit about how it came about. Yeah. What was your question? So Sorry. how did, okay. So you've got this busy practice and these four kids and you're also like an executive uh, coach and you work for companies like McKinsey and you're also advising nonprofits. How did Nunez Nunchi come about? What kind of inspired you to start this? Do you guys know that the answer to this question? Just wondering. What? No, I'm, I'm totally kidding. Um, I'll start with something fun. It came about because of the K-drama Startup. Who watched Startup? Okay. Are you Team Hanji Pyeong? No. 
what? Okay, I was like, why are you guys so quiet? Um, it, I'm asking, because that's actually how Nunez Nunchi came about. I always like to say it came out through that K-drama, not, not because of the K-drama, but I used that K-drama in the midst of the pandemic, so 2020. Uh, it was all the rage of 2020, if I remember, was the, the fall of 2020 when Startup came out. Oh, someone's alarm. And um, I was treating a lot of folks. We we're all in lockdown still, do you remember? And so folks were super depressed. And during that time, I was called in to help with college students. Uh, like, uh, and then I guess folks in colleges, mainly because all the students were back at home. And then two, uh, leaders of corporations. But it was with the college students that you know, it, they can be hard in the sense of they're very emotional and they'll say everything as is. But I, so I wanted to pivot the conversation because it was actually very depressing and it was very hard. So I went, we're on Zoom. Like, what are you guys watching? <laughs> you know, you guys ask each other that, K-drama people. What are you guys watching? And, um, and they were mentioning all these different things. And I go, no one's mentioning K-dramas. Are, are any of you guys watching K-dramas? Because I was talking to Asian American students. And then you just see their eyes going, yes. And... Long story short, I, I think Startup was the one that some of us were watching, not a lot, maybe like four out of the 30 people in these support groups. And then I decided just to use Startup, the K-drama in our sessions. I was like, you know, we're all watching this together. Let's start from episode one. I think by then it was like episode four or five. And we started viewing it together. And then it was during that time when I went, these are college students, they're like, Jeannie, you need to start a YouTube. I'm like, uh, I don't know what that is. I mean, I'm kidding, I do, but I was like, uh, you mean social media? They're like, yeah, you have a lot of content. This way we could just go and watch something instead of having to come always to a support group. At least you can have a mass reach. So long story short, that's how Nunes and she came about in the sense of me wanting to cheer people up. It was actually also during time in the Asian community, such contention with anti-Asian hate. So a lot of students were having, and these were some students who witnessed some crime, also professionals that think that had things happen to them. So it was another way of just talking about a story that wasn't about us, but it was about Han Ji Pyong or something fun. And, and it became fun when you're actually talking about a story, but, you're, but what I do is weave in things like, well, you just mentioned something about your mother and this trauma surrounding that. You want to talk about that. So I would just ask those questions as a therapist and bring it in. It made it much easier for folks to talk about their own story because they saw someone else's story. So that's how Nunchi came about. And the title was easy. Does anybody know what Nunchi means? Did you guys think you were going to talk in my sessions? Uh -huh. If you're in my sessions, you do talk. No. But someone was going to say, I see, you know, you, you know I talk about Nunchi. Were you going to say something? Hmm. Anybody want to guess or no? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Are you Korean? Yeah. Um, <laughs> not like you had to be, but it's hard for Koreans to explain it. Um, and then Korean Americans, we all know it. We grew yeah. up with it. But I already knew Nunchi was going to be the platform I was going to name at the time YouTube, which is how it started. Because Nunchi, the reading the room, being an active observer, participant, but also having a keen sense of making a decision based on what you see and feel, if that makes sense. So even in this room, if I'm doing a workshop, asking the right question. So I knew Nunchi was in my, in my um, platform title, but then what I really why I wanted to use it is in Korean culture, you know this, they'll tell you either you have it or you don't. Like Korean grandmothers and great aunts are really blunt and they'll be like, yeah, you got no nunchi. Or they'll be like, you got nunchi. So you're awesome. That kind of thing, right? So little, when I was little, I, I was told yeah. I had nunchi. So, um, and I just, and I remember that as like a, I don't know, maybe seven or eight. Like, my mom thinks I was five, but that's kind of young. But I think I remember clearly someone saying to my mom, like my great aunt, saying, Jeannie, or in Korean, Yujin, Yujin is my Korean name, she has nunchi. I'm watching her. And I just knew the way she said it, it was obviously in Korean, that it was a big deal. Because I sensed my mom going, yeah, like, I got a compliment for my daughter. You know, so it's so Asian. But um, that stuck with me, though. And I went, I think what she means is I'm good at seeing what's going on and then making some decisions, or going, ooh, I better not say anything. Ooh, I better ask a question. Somebody needs me to ask a question. So that became the title. 
And then I wanted something fun in front of Nunchi. Like, what goes well with Nunchi? And then I was like, Nuna. <laughs> um, just to be a play on words. And Nuna, you guys know, what does Nuna mean? Yeah. Older sister, yeah, which technically a guy would call an older sister or a man or whatever as a sister, older sister friend. But I could be that. Um, in real life, I'm an unneed to my younger sister, but it just sounded cute. And plus, I wanted to be seen as approachable, like an older sister who kind of observes what's going on. So that's how Nunez Nuchi came about. That's the whole, but it came from that K drama. And I will share that um, thanks to Squid Game, because I always have to say thanks to Squid Game. Because before then, even when I was using K-dramas, I actually used K-dramas in my work prior to that, though. Startup is when Nunez Nunchi came about, but I used it in a therapy session, and that's actually in my book, um, because I was trying to pivot a really tough family session. Like, I even talk about that going, it was like an awful session. If anybody's been through therapy, therapy's not easy, and that was one of those sessions where even as a therapist, I went, okay, um, either we cut the session short because it just got into like a screaming match, you know, which can happen between a mother and a child. So I pivoted it by saying, Any, do, to the teen, do you watch like K-dramas or C-dramas? Because this person was Chinese American. She's like, yeah. I was like, ah, I just pivoted the conversation. So long story short, I brought it in as homework. And that's how it started. And it all because I wanted to pivot the tone of a really heavy family conflict and then I told them to watch it, but quick story, since this is in the book, um, they came back and they were only supposed to watch one episode. They watched all 20 of Reply, of Reply 1988. Oh, so, and that's one of my favorites. And, and it, they still, of course, had their issues, but what it did was, because I made them watch it together, was they watched it separately. To get, I mean, watched it separately, actually, the whole K-drama together. I mean, not together, but separately, but the whole point was, I was able to bring in references going, okay, so remember the scene where he says this and he didn't tell his mom this? I think that's what's happening. That kind of thing. And that just made the daughter go, oh, yeah, because they saw the, they saw the expressions of the characters. They're characters, but you could see it and then kind of relate it to your own life. So that was that. And then I brought it into a workshop like a year later, pre-pandemic. So I already knew it was a way to talk about mental health, but it was thanks to Squid Game that I brought it in almost a big part of my practice. And now, <laughs> now I'm like, because before I'd be like, so, uh, so Google, I'm gonna bring in, you know, I would like sheepishly say, I'd like to bring in a K-drama and wait for the reaction of like, what? But I guess after Squid Game, now it's like, oh, so you're hiring me. So yeah, two K-drama clips, is that good? You know, and I'll just not even ask, they're like, yes. And, and so funny when I don't mention it, I love how they're like, wait, you didn't mention you're gonna bring K-dramas. That's why we wanted you to come speak. So that is just a pivot of where we are today. And a little bit of that is my book, because obviously now today is 2024, and so much has happened even in the last six months. So that's how, that's a long version of how Nunez Nunchi came about. But yes, that's, it's become such a part of my practice. Um, so I wanted to call out some things that I noticed um, when I started reading your book was that you marvel at points, actually often um, throughout the book, where you're kind of, you're amazed at sort of the global popularity of Korean, like, again, because we both grew up in the, uh, we were both immigrant kids in the 70s, 80s, where, and you actually wrote about this in your book, and I related so much to this, um, where people would ask you, are you Chinese, are you Japanese, and you would say Korean, and the, the question would be, well, what's, what is that? And to go and then to fast forward to now, where, you know, Korean dramas are like the global number one hit on a lot of these streaming platforms. What do you think it is about K-dramas that really kind of foster this feeling that you mentioned in your book about belongingness and connection? I mean, we connect, we actually met remotely during the pandemic. And as soon as we found out that we both like K-dramas, there was this instant connection. So what do you think it is about K-dramas that really encourage that? You just said a really good like instant connection, right? Well, I feel like asking you guys this. Is there a mic for you guys now? Uh, I mean, what is it about K-dramas that drew you in? And you could think of your answers, and that's a question I ask on my tour, right? Tracy, Christina, Renee, Somni, who else is on my tours? Um, and I'm so glad the people from my tours are here. But, oh, thank you, and she has a mic. Um, but I'll start off with, uh, before I ask you that, guys that, please, I do want you to share. I. I do marvel at it. I, it gets a little uncomfortable because I'm not trying to make pe people uncomfortable, but when you're, gr when, you, when you're growing up and you're made fun of for the very things that are loved now, things like kimchi, uh, bibimbap, kimbap, I see people like, 
I'll get your DMs and I read all of them. People are going, Jeannie, take a look at the kimbap I made. I'm like, what? You make kimbap? But that, and you're non Korean. That to me is still, even though it seems like it's not a big deal, it is to me. And I write that in the book because, and I think I still marvel because, again, again, not to make people uncomfortable, I, we were very, we, I also was very made fun of for being Korean. And so that's why I think a lot of this has helped my own mental health. This is my own journey. You're reading a book of stories of you guys, the community, and how I tie to my, the K-dramas I love, but I'm really also talking about what this has looked like from a therapist perspective, as the Jeannie Chang perspective, as a Korean American that struggled being Korean. Like there are many times, you, I think you've heard that in my reels where I'm like, oh my gosh, like I at one point maybe detested being Korean. I mean, that's pretty strong. Only because they would look at you and going, no, you're not really, you, you mean you're, you're from China? I'm like, oh my God, Korea is a real country. I kid you not, some people in certain states, because I was, grew outside of Philadelphia in a very, I would say non-diverse suburb. I love where I grew up, but that would be the common thing and then I'd be like, Ugh, well, they don't know my country, so I don't want to know my country. I mean, that kind of is, which is why that's a lot of my work, that intersectionality of your mental health and who you are, whatever background you come from. So, um, and then so with the K-dramas, I just told you with my, re I mean, I'm going to tell you with my research, how many of you started watching K-dramas in the pandemic? Let's start there. Raise your hand high. Oh, you too? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. You have a good story. Um, okay, so it's less than half. So a lot of you before then, I'm assuming, I'm asking because um, according to research, you guys know, I mean, Netflix was out there. We're all stuck in our homes. So we're like, let's stream. And then you see K-dramas coming about. And during that time, and also not just my work in mental health, but just what we're seeing in our country in 2020, it was very difficult times, adversity to political, I'll, I'll share this, political contention. I work a lot with crisis management in organizations and they would bring me in because of political contention over people who didn't get along due to separate, I mean, you know, different political views. But I'm bringing that in because lots of folks have shared to me that they turned to K-dramas because they were just unhappy with perhaps what was happening here. They're like, you know what? And I'll just say this, America sucks right now. I need to look for something different. And that's what, you know, I didn't say that in my book, but that's what I would hear. And they were like, let me just look for something different. I'm so tired of this show, this, what is this crash landing? Crash landing and what, North Korean soldier? I mean, you know what I mean? They're reading this and they're like, this is Asian, let me try it. And that's, I kid you not, that was a big one. That was probably the biggest gateway. And It's Okay to Not Be Okay was actually around that as well. And E21 class, if you guys saw those. Those were right around the time that people turned to K-dramas because it was there. And then they got, you guys got hooked is what I want to say. So I'm going to pause there because I want to hear from you if you don't mind because we have a mic. Um, remember, I, I like to ask people to share. Uh, what, like, what drew you in about K-dramas? Oh, we have somebody on the left. Is this on? Yes. Oh, sorry, and then you. Uh, so for me, um, I actually visited Korea when I was living in Hong Kong, but I didn't know much about the country and I fell in love with it, fell in love with the food and the culture, the cafe culture. So years later, my friend posted a, a trailer about Let's Eat, and I love food as well, like Let's Eat too, and it just yeah. drew me in. So that was oh, um, the okay. first one I watched. And after that, I didn't really watch for a while. And I think maybe around the pandemic, I picked it up again. Okay. Thanks for yeah. sharing that. Yeah, that's a good one. Let's eat. And then someone over here. Yeah. Oh, where did I? Oh. <laughs> Thank you. I just started a couple months ago. So I'm brand new to this world. Um, but I did remember when I was a kid, my mom used to watch K-dramas. And I asked her, Did, were you around the same age when I, start, when, when I started watching? And she said, yeah, I was a mom, and I like to see the kids be respectful to their parents on television. <laughs> and now that I'm a mom, I like seeing that as well. That what, are, so what are you watching right now? Yeah. Um, right now, I just finished Queen of Tears. So, so thank you. We can talk about that. <laughs> I'm going to write that one down. I think we have one more person over here, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a very unique um, perspective on this because it started when I was like, this is such a bad age to start K-drama. Like, I was 12 <laughs> in middle school. And then, like, the other, like, Asian Filipino girl was like, oh, do you want to watch this K-drama? It was the Moon Embracing Sun. 
if you know what it is. It's a good one. We were in the middle of it. I was like, wait, this is so interesting and so much more complex. See, exactly. It's such a good K-drama. It was so complex compared to what it is in America. And then once you know it, like once you start, you never stop. So that was me as a 12-year-old. I had to stop. I had phases because, you know, school got in the way and everything. But it's, I feel like just the setup on how it's so, it's just so fast paced in those cliffhangers. And like these are characters who I genuinely care about, not just like in America who are so complex compared to the American characters. And it's interesting because like my mom just doesn't like to watch it with me because she doesn't like to read subtitles with me. So it's an interesting yeah. dynamic I have. But now I hear about that too. Yeah. That subtitles can be, you know, hard. So people watch dubbed. Yeah. yeah. So I have a completely different perspective about the subtitles. Yeah, so I started watching K-dramas during the pandemic. Crash Landing on You was my very first one. And I liked it, but it didn't go anywhere. But then back in 2022, in like between three years, I lost two dogs. Two of my, like they were my kids and one just dropped dead in front of me. And I needed to just log off. And I think what helped me with K-drama was the fact that I didn't understand the language, so I had to read. So now my mind is engaged while I'm watching it. Like any other content, I can switch off because you know I can, I can understand the language. But with Korean drama, first, the plots are amazing, right? There's not much violence to deal with, and it's just very, very smooth. And the fact that I just didn't know the language, I had to read, and it was so engaging. It helped me get over the trauma. So, you know, I love K-dramas. I've watched over 100 now. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> That's the addiction, yeah. Yeah, actually, that's 100 is actually okay. I've heard of like 700, or, but uh, but you. I just want to point something out. You said, oh, okay, so putting therapist cap. So I guess it helped you with just navigating your grief. I mean that that is the longest chapter in my book, actually, because I found that it wasn't because of the pandemic. It's just I wrote it toward the tail end of the pandemic, but or last year, which was at that end. But grief is just a really well portrayed in K-dramas, because there's a lot of grief even in the culture, you know? But seeing that, I think it helped people tell me, I would, and their stories are in there, but things like, I just realized I never processed this from like 30 years ago. Then they saw this K-drama and went, oh my goodness, is that what's been plaguing me for 30 years? I mean, that stuff to me is like powerful stories. I'm like, wow, you got that from one scene even. And then they watched, I mean, and, you know, you guys know those powerful scenes of like epiphanies. So, um, that's why, that's why I talk about transformation, you know, how it just ended up transforming. Just that, even a moment of going, I'm going to change my life, or oh my goodness, to me, it's enough where you just go, I just brought, I had a self-awareness about myself that I didn't realize that I've been angry, which is a, a, a form of grief. I've been angry for 30 years, and finally I let that anger go. That's like those precious stories, right? Someone else was going to share, yeah. I think, over there. Yeah. So I'm from Hawaii, so I was lucky enough to be able to just watch it on regular TV there because they're just broadcast. Um, I guess there's there's a very large Asian American community. So the first K drama I watched was Winter Ballad or Winter Sonata back oh, in yeah. 2002, wow. um, and I started watching because my grandma was watching. Um, I'm not Korean, but she just was into watching those shows, and I think I have stayed such a fan because. One thing that I really appreciate about K-dramas is that it's like a variety of genres in a single show. I feel like American shows are very like, it's a thriller, or this is a prestige drama, and it's serious, and they don't have humor, or they don't have romance, but a lot of K-dramas have all of those elements in, in one show, so I really enjoy that aspect. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else pressing to share? Here we See, go. I opened up this big... <laughs> Why? What's K-dramas mean to you? I think somebody over there in this... Oh, yeah. sorry. Oh, just, just real quick. First of all, it's very exciting to see you and meet you. And I was very nervous today because <laughs> so, this means so much. So um, I, f I started watching K-dramas during the pandemic, during a major life transition. And I was enthralled by learning the culture. I was introduced a little bit to Korean culture as a kid through my dad because he was stationed in Korea. So in the ensuing years, I've made myself learn more about the culture and about the history and America's role in it. But K-dramas are also just fun. And as a science educator in Chloe, when she survives a tornado, I remember sitting there going, I'm here for the rest of this story. <laughs> so thank you very much. Oh, thank you. And then the, that thing I like to talk about, suspension of disbelief of like things that you know it's not realistic, but we keep moving on because it's a good story. Thanks for sharing that and being here. Um, hi. I grew up in Los Angeles. I immigrated in the early 80s with my family or with my parents. So 
my parents watched K dramas from like the VC VHS from the Korean like you know video store where they get it from Korea and they make copies and then rent them out. So, Chon um, Wonegi was one that like my parents watched a lot. Um, I'm really excited about the Tejangum renewal. I think there's a new one coming out. Um, so it's been a long time and I go in and out because I think the drama sometimes is a little too close and a little intense in some of the storylines. But one connection I met, made recently was I recently watched Kyungsang Creature. Um, and that was incredibly powerful in that it's, it's this like kind of science fiction, but the fact of like, it helped me understand Japanese colonialism in Korea in a way that I don't, I, was in a, I studied Asian American studies in college, but even then, like, I don't think I quit, quite understood the impact of colonialism in Korea and how the, like, the lasting impact of that in our culture and society, both for those still in Korea and those of us, you know, who live, the diaspora who's outside of that. And I think it's like this really interesting connection for someone like me as a, as a 1.5 or second generation um, uh, Korean American, not quite having the, always the language to have those conversations with my own family members, but having this third point as another vehicle to understand my culture and my history better. So I feel like in that way, that's really helpful. And then also like being able to share that with folks who are non-Koreans through this media platform, um, which I think is really, really powerful, so. Thank you so much. Anyone's pressing to share? Oh, yes, somebody. Sorry, I didn't, you didn't think you'd walk that many steps today. <laughs> Actually, I like getting my steps Okay, there, good. So. <laughs> Hi, I'm a little bit nervous myself, but I just started during the pandemic also and also started with Chloe. And my reason for, I mean, people have, Friends have said, you gotta watch Korean drama. You're gonna enjoy it, really. I said, no, I don't want to. The subtitles are too much for me, you know? I'm on the computer the whole day. There's just no way. <laughs> but um, my situation's different. My husband had a stroke, and I think I've, I've written to you before, and um, he had a stroke 14 years ago. And just recently, my daughter has been diagnosed with um, breast cancer. But prior to that, because of my husband's situation, I felt, you know, working full time, coming home, taking care of him, and not having time for myself. And when I watched Chloe, there was a point where, um, where that separation, that, you know, when she was just torn, right? And it made me think of um, families that had to go through this trauma. Uh, my parents are from the Philippines. And I was born and raised here, but there are people who have, that, that live here and, what they call in the Philippines TNT, which is Tago Nantago, where they, they don't have the papers and they hide. And then just, I have seen families gone through that. And it made me realize, because my father's been here since 1920, in the 1920s. And, um, but he would go back and forth, he was a seaman. And it just made me realize so, what so many families go through when they have to be separated. And it made me feel for my father and my aunts and my uncles and you know cousins who have gone through this. And it also helped me deal with my situation at home when I'm watching K drama. I'm angry at them. I'm happy. I'm I'm laughing, crying, and it just it's a stress reliever for me to watch. You know, so thank, thank you so you. much for sharing that. Yeah, you just touched on how I also like how we get all these emotions out through K dramas, like in one scene. Like sometimes you're crying, then you're laughing, then you're mad. Sometimes I just think that's amazing, but that's actually really healthy. Like you, to to get mad and hate a character like Queen of Tears, poor actor. But everybody, <laughs> poor actor. Yeah, everybody <laughs> hates him. But then and then then you just then you cry because something that the actress said. But all of that does matter to our mental health, which is why I also think it's a great way to process. You know, I think someone else is going to share back there. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Selena. Really thrilled to be here. The, the topic particularly caught my attention is especially the K-drama connection with mental health. Um, I'm not Korean, I'm Chinese, but I recall when the pandemic per first broke out, um, I, I work at a pharmaceutical company. Right? I remember thinking to myself, when I introduce myself to someone at work, do I even want to say I'm Chinese? Uh, at that time, there's a lot of right, anti-hate against China and, and Chinese. You are the, right? 
And then I even have thoughts about, should I even tell them I'm Chinese? Is that going to influence my career? Is that going to influence how they're going to see me and hear me and perceive me, all of that? And um, the good news is, I, after through, through all of that internal conversation, I now introduce myself as, I am unapologetically Chinese. And my name is Selena, and this is my role, right? So what, what I would love to hear from you a little bit also, folks, where a lot of us have Asian friends or we come from Asian family, whether Korean, Japanese, Vietnamese, Japanese, it, it doesn't matter, right? Um, I know for sure when I grow up, nobody taught me about mental health. Nobody helped me to understand, not, not anyone's fault, but we, we didn't grow up knowing how important it is in our life. We don't know how to deal with big emotions. Certainly, we're not equipped to process how to, um, how to handle these drama, right? We all have drama in our life and at work. Or I'm curious, what, what, what's your message to us? How do we better equip ourselves to, to be with our emotions, not to suppress it, but be with it, recognize it, um, face it, and process it? Um, yeah, what are your thoughts? Um, so read my book, no. <laughs> but um, that's a big question, but I, I would say I think that's the, the message of my book. I actually wrote the book, I always tell people this, it's not about K-dramas. I make it very clear. Yes, it is. I'm using K-dramas. It's really about mental health. I mean, that's the perspective. If you look at my chapters, you'll see me name them K-dramas and grief, K-dramas and traumas, you know, or K-dramas and um, PTSD. So I'm, I want to break through that stigma because even though the stigma is very deep in our community, the Asian community, it's actually, from my experience, is everywhere. Um, even in those, I, I sympathize a lot with or empathize a lot with um, folks in corporate you know, corporate America, I work with them a lot, and I've, I've, I think it's a privilege to work with these big corporations and leaders and see them vulnerable, but they face the stigma too, um, in, even in their organizations. And so I see a lot of different angles, and also I wrote the book thinking about anybody who was even, my hope was, you don't have to be a K-drama fan. Now, you may want to be drawn to it because you're a K-drama fan, but I hope you read it and going, oh, it's also about mental health, but I see transform in there, and, and then obviously lessons. I mean, to me, I wanted to share, so the very thing you're asking, every chapter I hope has some sort of lesson or a takeaway of how to do something, but I always say this, which is why people don't always like this answer, really depends on the person. So for instance, you're watching, you turn to K-dramas for very different reasons. We all turn it for different reasons, and because we're all different. So I think that's really important to know that what how you may have turned to it, and that may be your reason, and that's when something you're, you want to work on. But then it might be something else where there's a family situation. And actually, I did bring a clip, because of course I like bringing clips, okay? So the Queen of Tears clip I wanted to share, if we have time, uh, and of course, time's already flying, but um, the processing of emotions, that's actually 50%. If you actually got to the point of like, oh my God, I am, like, you know, I, I realize I was, I've been very hurt. Okay, let's just say a very really tough emotion. I would say, wow, you're like a little bit over halfway there. The rest would be, what are you going to do to navigate that hurt? Talk to a family member or cut ties from the family member. That's also, and there's examples of that in my book through the K-dramas, right, that we see, but they're healthier. So I hope when you read the book, each chapter gives some sort of lesson of, oh, this is what PTSD looks like, and this is what I am experiencing, or this is what a family member is experiencing, or what a friend or colleague is. I didn't write the book for, to be prescriptive. It's more like, I hope have conversations. You read something and you're like, you know, I'd like to talk to my mom about this. And especially as an Asian, Emotions 101 is not something that we talk about. <laughs> I would say, do you even know you're sad? And I'll have people tell me, can I even be sad? I'm like, You'd be surprised. In some cultures, they don't talk about feeling sad or even happy. Like, I'm like, it looks like you're happy. And they're like, I am. I'm like, I think you can be happy. And so that's all in my book of like, why that's important. Just go, you know what? I am happy. And then I'll always ask, I hope you know why you're happy. Like, if you're happy, then I would hope that it might be, you know what? It's because I went to Jeannie's event today and I'm really happy. But know that because I would ask you to do something like that again. So that's in the book of like why I want you to identify something and you know in that very moment, this made me stressed out. I think it's this person. It sounds terrible to say, but you know those people in your life. 
sadly, but then you kind of separate and then you know what to do. And I, those are the little things that come, I hope come out of the book. So I'm giving you like snippets of what I try to talk about that I've seen in different instances, but then you might read something going, I had no idea that this is what Jeannie would bring out. But a lot of it I think is pretty straightforward, hopefully. That was a long, short way of me answering your, your question, but um, do we have more questions? Where are we on time? Oh my God, it's almost 2.50. Okay, so I wanted to just share, can I share a clip? Please. Okay. Yes. Did you have a question? Yes. Okay, so this is just my model. I'm just giving you, you're, you're getting a glimpse of some of what I talk about in corporate America, let me tell you. Um, you hear me talk about Chong. Uh, it's on my book. And like I knew I might get emotional talking about this, but I said to the publisher, I have to have that word on my book. And they actually didn't push, but they went, okay, tell us why. I go, well, first of all, I'm Korean, and Chung is what I feel right now with all of you. But that is also what you experience when you see a K-drama. Or second, what you experience when you meet a fellow person in the community. That's why I get emotional, because I'm like, it's very powerful. In fact, if there's nothing that you specifically get as a lesson from the book, I hope it's actually you feel connected to a community of people that you may have never met. You know, And I got to witness this, and that's why I love my tours, because I see people coming on these tours. Some of them are here, don't know each other, but what do we have in common? Well, well, they all know me, but then also the, the K-dramas they watch. And the Chung that I want to instill, because it's Korean-based, is that emotional feeling of almost like euphoria because you feel like you're not alone. Even in my platform, I'll see people share, and there's tons of comments sometimes, not always positive, but, but almost always of people going, I went through the same thing. I love when I see, oh, I totally fear you at, you know, when you tag somebody at you. I also felt that grief, or I also experienced that trauma. But that's why I get emotional because I think growing up, I didn't feel like we had a, I had a community. And then I see this, but it's not you guys being part of my community. It's actually you guys connecting with anybody all around the world. And that just makes the world a little bit closer. So this is the best definition I can think of. It is so hard to describe, but it's a feeling. And, um, and it's, it's what you see threaded in all the K-drama relationships, even tough ones, right? Um, and then, of course, Nunchi. Uh, and Nunchi is... Um, by the way, you all have this, you all, everybody can read the room and everybody can understand, hey, this person, she's, she, is there something off with that person? That's Nunchi. And then being able to gauge what's the best form of action, maybe not asking the person a question or maybe asking the person a question. I need to have that in my job. There are times people will say to me and I'll be like, something doesn't add up. Are you okay? No. I, I mean, they'll be like, what's going on? Like if I ask like an open-ended question, then they'll hem and haw and then finally I'll just have to be point blank going, Okay, I need to understand if what you're about to tell me or what you think you can't tell me is something traumatic. That's nunchi, where I felt like I would have to bring something out of somebody and be that blunt. And maybe in your situation, you might have to do that too, to reach somebody or have somebody, or maybe someone reached out to you that way. And that's, we can all build this, you know? And I talk about this in leadership circles, even in corporate America. And I love when they're like, this is a cool term. We're going to just say, let's nunchi it out, you know? <laughs> um, so... I'm not going to show this clip. This is from Hometown Cha Cha Cha. But I tend to show this clip to show how, do you guys remember this clip? How well this exchange was. And I show this even on my tours about how well she handled what he shared. So we might be in her situation and we might be in his situation of sharing something very difficult. But their receiving and giving was just a really good example. That's that. But then, um, oh, sorry. Do you remember this scene? Who watched uh, Attorney Wu? This is her opening statement. I, mean, I guess I could share this, but this is a good example of someone being really blunt about who they are. She could have just been a lawyer herself, and, and people might be like, oh, you're acting a little bit interesting. But she put it out there as in she claimed it as part of her identity and said it the way she wanted, going, I am on the spectrum, I have autism. I mean, she specifies it even in Korean and says, so, but I'm gonna do the best of my ability. And, and I'm not saying you have to declare a diagnosis or that's not what I mean, but you can, you can claim your own identity the way you want. 
And sometimes it's better if you, if you want to break through stigma, you say it first yourself. And that's what she did. And so the rest of the story kind of unfolded. But I saw this and I thought, I hope we can learn from that. Again, not literally, but how do we just, even though something's difficult, but say, hey, this is what I'm struggling with. And I'm actually seeing that a lot in our community. And that's really empowering. And also less lonely because you'll find that. Sorry. Let me get to Queen of Tears. Who watched Queen of Tears? Okay, but I hope I don't, this is, is this a spoiler? No, this is not a spoiler. I always have to make sure I don't spoil things. But in this scene, the mom and daughter. So you know their relationship was tough. I've seen that though. Some of us have had that in our families too. It's a very tough relationship with our own parent or family member. And I really thought this scene was like probably the best scene. I mean, everyone's like, there's a lot of other good scenes. But I meant when it came to like therapeutically, I wanted to just share the scene. And I thought it could be a good lesson. So let me just share the scene, because there's so much to share. Do you guys know her, remember her relationship? Um, anybody want to like share? This is what I would do. Like, let's pretend we're actually in one of my workshops. What is a takeaway from that? Like as you're watching the scene, what? No, uh, okay. Well, no, it's okay. I think you can share that. that yeah. I'll just say there was a traumatic experience that explains why the mother treated the daughter the way she did. And I think this moment showed that they don't necessarily have to rehash what happened, but they can move forward in a more positive direction. Mm. That's, yeah, that's one takeaway. So by the way, there's no wrong answer to this, right? Yes. Um, it shows them acknowledging what went wrong and how they can move forward without jumping like many through many hoops. They can just take their time and do it their own way. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, as a family therapist, like it doesn't happen over. I mean, nothing changes overnight. The the overnight might have been a revelation of, without spoiling something with her own daughter that she realized that changed her ways. So that happens in a tragedy or tragic like situation or crisis. But then I really like that they're both like acknowledging awkwardness, which I think is realistic. Like it's just, you know, sometimes you see people completely turn 180%, 180 degrees. That's not abnormal, but I just think that's really well done to handle going, I'm still, we're still awkward. We don't, we haven't even talked in like 20 years, even though we're mom and daughter. And then her just saying, yeah, let's take it slowly. And it's okay that we're awkward. I share that because those are examples of little things of like an everyday situation too, where we expect something to change like that after you have a tough conversation, but that doesn't always, it doesn't always happen that way. It can be gradual, but even having that tough conversation that they had or the revelation of something that was happening that the mom realized how she was, that's I think pretty good. And then it's all about just baby steps and maybe even sometimes one step back, right? Because you, you get back into habits of how you were so I like sharing that. There's other clips to share, but I'm wondering if I answered any other questions. Did you have questions? Did anybody else have questions for me? No? Okay. Do you have questions? <laughs> I, mean, I have a lot. <laughs> yeah. Oh, let me Maybe here. just like a couple because, I don't know, like two questions from you, Susan? Yeah. Maybe? Okay. Or um, like wrap it up. No, just kidding. <laughs> so, um, I have a sort of a short one and then a long one, but for the short one, what is your favorite K-drama of all time and why? Oh, yeah, I have a clip of that. <laughs> Who knows what my favorite K-drama is of all time? Okay, no, but that's second. <laughs> that's second. But sometimes it ties with first, but it's, I would say it's second. Anybody know? Someone said it. My yes. My mister. Who saw my mister? It's not an easy watch, right? It's not an easy watch, but actually that's the, the, the source of my title because um, 
Uh, you know, and you know what happened with that actor. So that was just all that timing and all that. But transformation is what I saw in that drama. And it's what I also felt watching such transformation of two characters. I highly recommend it if you haven't seen it. But again, I also know it's a little bit melancholy. It has a very melancholy feel till maybe the last few episodes. But you're seeing a girl change before your eyes through learning about a man that's twice her age. So maybe in certain communities, it'd be like, how come they're not to getting together? But that's the chung or the connection of Korean dramas where it's like they didn't have any of that and they had a friendship that was actually very, I think, transformative. And then there's moments that he, there's like content in there in the Korean language and it was actually translated well of like him saying, you changed my life, you 21 year old girl, mm -hmm. you know? And I didn't realize you came to save me and that changed she d thought her life was worthless. So that's just kind of the story. But that is my all-time favorite because I go to that. But I don't always, the most recommended is not that one. Reply 1988 is much more recommended. But I think that's my all-time favorite as in what it's done for me. And that's why I named the, t that's why I had to have transform in my title. And that's my word of the year. But I do have a clip. Oh, no, you had a question. What was another question? Let's watch the clip Oh, first. the clip is, clip. wait a second, where's that clip? <laughs> Here it is. Anybody remember this, just from seeing this one scene? Okay, I'll just set it up. It's the main character at work. And some news breaks at work. And here's the reaction of his colleagues. Oops. Is it this? What's going on here? Play, wait, wait. Call me. Oh. So he just got promoted. Promoted, wouldn't you want that reality? Bad guy. I love this actress. I mean, I, I share that because what a good example. I share that in the workplace, saying, can you guys do that for each other? <laughs> but I, that's the chung, and I just, I just like that scene. There's many scenes, but I choose that one because I'm a corporate speaker, and I, share, I talk a lot about workplace change and culture, and that is, to me, uh, just a wonderful example of love in that community that wanted to see him succeed. And you never saw that? Never saw that in the world. No. Yes, but when I share that, I'm just looking for transformation where they're like seeing an example. And it's okay, and actually I've never gotten the reaction of like, okay Jeannie, that's never gonna happen, but more like, that's really encouraging. It would be nice. Yeah, and I'll tell you, <laughs> I was like sharing this story, and I, I'm allowed to share this, sometimes I have to sign NDAs, but at a Google sales summit, a woman in front of me, I saw her kind of getting emotional, not at the scene, at some other scene, but my whole point is, I shared the scene, and, and I go, did you want to share something? Because she was like right in front of me. She's like, okay, well, everyone knows me as pretty stoic, and they're like, yeah, you know? <laughs> so maybe she wasn't well liked, but they were like, um, the, she goes, I never show emotion. I can't, I'm an executive vice president. I'm like, well, yes, you can, but there's just ways of showing it. But then she goes, but I'll have to admit, I saw a clip 
that you showed me don't even know what a K-drama is, and I shed a tear. She said, she, 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 but everyone's cracking up at that point, but even that was transformative, because they said, Jeannie, we never heard her say that, and we, we knew she would something grasp her to say, and she didn't even share why she teared, and I didn't even ask. But it was just her being honest, going, I shed a tear, and I'm trying to figure out why I shed that tear, and I'm like, okay, and that's, that's transformation. Anyways, yeah, so highly recommend. And then finally, just to close out, can you share a story that's kind of indelibly printed in your brain, um, a story that you've heard that came out of your work with Nunez Ninchi? Yeah, um, gosh, so many. Hmm. I guess it would be, actually, um, it it's recent, but I'll, I'll share the one in my book. There is a, gosh, he's a brilliant, brilliant attorney, former attorney. Um, but one tragic night, he made a mistake and killed someone with a DUI. And that's in my book, but I didn't, I didn't go into his crime, per se. He called it a crime, and he went to jail. And he was the kind of attorney, as in, that represented all of pretty much Silicon Valley. He's from here. And he actually sadly could not make it, because I was going to put him up on stage, because he's proud to share his story. But he told me he found hope in prison because of K-dramas. So he was in prison serving. He got out, I think, for good behavior and all that for, um, after seven years, and it was the last four years. He said, believe it or not, in this prison right here, if you say the prison. Yeah, San Quentin. Um, and he's very open about his story, but I heard him on Clubhouse, an audio app, and I went, I need to have your story. This is before the book. And what he was sharing with me was he's in He's actually the only white male in that prison. And he was like, what's, what's all going, what's going on on the Saturday night that there's this commotion in like the big common room? And he found, he told me, and he was honest. He goes, these are murderers, rapists, terrible people actually for their crimes, actually terrible uh, crimes that they committed, bawling like babies, watching K-dramas in the common room. And I went, and, and he told me, he was like, there, he actually said there's this, and that's not in the book because I didn't expand so much. I just talked about his journey with K-dramas, but he would tell me things like people he was scared of were bawling like babies, so he sat next to them going, what are you guys, like, what's, what are you watching that's making you cry? They were like, and he's telling me, oh my God, it's like awesome, you need to watch this. And, and, and he's telling me, this is what it's like in the um, comment, and I think they volunteered at the San Quentin paper, so they were all in the newsroom watching these K-dramas, he called it on the back channels of the prison. Um, and he actually couldn't remember the name of his first one, but he started watching them all on the cable channels in prison, and he says that's what got him through prison the last four years. And then now, yeah, he lost his license. He can never practice law again. So his, cha his, his, his life is different. I know it's been hard coming out of prison, but what he says is still, I still get an occasional DM or email going, are you watching this? I love this. And I'm like, of course I'm watching it. And so that story was, yeah. it's pretty... Um, when he says it gave me hope and it gave me aspiration that he, even if he said he knew he'd come out of prison just because he didn't get a life sentence, but he just thought even outside of prison, I feel like there's something more I can hope for. Because he told me before that he was just, he told me a cocky attorney that thought he could do it all. And then one night he made a mistake. And so, and then he told me, um, and that's actually, is it in the book where he reconciled with the parents of the kid that he killed? I mean, it was a tragic case. Um, but K-dramas continue to still be his, I guess, in some sense, saving grace, as he says. So that story. Yeah. But you have a story, too. Uh, I think we should wrap up with yours. About, yeah. About uh, how you came to K-dramas in 2020, Miss Former three-time CEO, by the way. Uh, um, yeah. How did, how did you find it in the pandemic? So I, January, the pandemic was 2020. Lockdown happened here in the Bay Area, uh, March or April. But January 1st, 2020, I had a pretty bad um, accident where I... Uh, essentially shattered my left leg. And so I was laid up in bed and I was still trying to work. And I was, it, for me, just that loss of mobility and feeling fragile and um, was hard. And also as an extrovert, then with the lockdown was hard and being bedridden. Um, and so I started watching K-dramas because it was on Netflix, just kind of like all of you. Um, the one that I ended up watching was Inheritors. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and 
in the first couple episodes, especially because it takes place in the US and the English is so bad, <laughs> that I was like, this is stupid. But I just kept watching. And by the end of it, I was bawling like a baby. And also like fell madly in love with Gimubin, the, yeah. the antagonist. Gimubin. Yeah. yeah. 